I see. I I, I had really high hopes because I was going to go see Nate Silver talk. You know, the five thirty eight guy. I yes. Was, I, was, I was looking forward to graphs, and it was such a letdown. I'll tell you guys about it. It was. It was Wait. So he didn't speak there. No, he did. He's he's just a terrible speaker, and he didn't <laughs> really. Speak, yes, at, or oh. show any graphs. He just like gave vague opinions about things. It was terrible. I love Nate Silver. I mean, conceptually, but not in the flesh. I, I love him as a theoretical construct that makes good polling graphs. But that's about you it. Love him, but you're not in love with him. That is exactly what I said, but paraphrased. <laughs> Was Nate Silver? Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of The Problem with Reading. I'm Brevin. Even. And I'm Sam. And uh, we are uh, uh, walking on air. We are 100% prepared. We have an action-packed full episode for you. Uh, nothing has gone wrong. Everything is fine. <laughs> we are all well-rested. We have copious notes. Uh, we we've love been, the chapter that we We've read. been publishing for the last three weeks consistently. Yeah, we've been publishing <laughs> for the last three weeks. Uh, your, your, don't trust your lying eyes. Um, uh, we, are, we are consistent. No, um, but actually, the hope is to do this one today, whatever day this actually comes out, and then record another one on Saturday, because uh, the show must go on, and we must produce content. Content production. That has become our Talos. Oh damn! <laughs> We're not content producers. We are not human beings. We are human producers. Hey, if we are to produce content, we must produce content excellently. We must do it well, and in doing so, we will have uh, virtue. So, therefore, the break is really warranted because we were just preparing to make good content. We're back mm-hmm. and better than ever. You know, if we had just taken the break like three weeks from now, when well, I guess more than that, five weeks. How many chapters are there? Eighteen. 18, I believe, uh, plus a, a postscript, uh, pu- plus a bibliography. Okay. Well, plus an index. Are we going to do an episode on the bibliography? I, I want oh, to do we, oh, an absolutely. episode on the index. <laughs> now, his index is actually kind of sad compared to some other people. But that's just because he's writing technical and not referencing pop culture, which is fun. Anyway, wow. So we've just shifted straight into McIntyre, but let's not do that. Um, so, uh, uh, Stephen, uh, what, are you, what are you drinking right now? Ah, well, Brevin, I'm glad you asked. I am drinking some sparkling ice water, which is not, you know, water that is sparkling and also has ice in it, but it's rather a brand of water. Um, It's it's pretty much orange juice that allegedly has zero sugar, antioxidants, and vitamins, but I'm just going to assume probably safely that's not good for me. So it's a La Crux knockoff. Pretty much, except with (laughs) with actual flavor. Not just essence. <laughs> sometime, <laughs> sometime we're gonna have to run through all of the great Lacroix jokes. Like there are still many. Lacroix tastes like someone whispering the name of a fruit in the other room, <laughs> or Lacroix tastes like drinks in a world in which flavor is the most valuable resource. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. Yep. Uh, Sam, what are you drinking? I am drinking a lovely cold. Um, 2019, uh, brewed in Seattle, actually. Um, emergency, super orange flavored. I am, I'm sick. So we're we're trying to get by right now. If you were going to end that <laughs> sentence with water, I was going to be so bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It is it's home. It's homemade, actually. Uh, mixed it today about ten minutes. Mixed it yourself. Mixed it myself. Yeah. Dang, man. Yeah. That's pro Wow. Uh, as as for myself, uh, what am I drinking right now? <clears throat> I am drinking the substance that sustained the bones of the ancients, the produce of the noble beasts that with guns, germs, and steel gave the Fertile Crescent and later Europe and China the keys to dominate their neighbors and even lands far across the seas. Stop where you are. Did you just reference Jared Diamond? Yes. Wait, also, I I would like to know, guns conquered the Fertile Crescent? I think guns came significantly. I said later Europe. Shut up. Let me continue. (laughs) (laughs) These noble beasts lived in our caves and our huts, granting us microbes and disease, but with it increased resilience to the plagues that are the most deadly of external enemies. I speak, of course, of the great family of domesticated cattle and the substance in my cup, 2% milk. Long may the horned lords live among us, and long may they sustain the calcified pillars in the center of our physical beings. I'm drinking milk. Well done. (laughs) 
Hey, uh, there's, wow. there's actually a really fun fact. Uh, the first person to try cow milk was really, really thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I can imagine. Yeah, what's the thing? Yeah, it's Jim Gaffigan has a sketch on this. Is like yes, the, he does. The first people to try certain foods, like like uh, bacon. Like, yeah, or or oysters. Like, hey guys, I found snot in a rock. <laughs> what does it taste like? <laughs> Pneumonia. <laughs> That's a good sketch. <laughs> worth worth watching. Uh, and you know what else is a good sketch? Uh, After Virtue, Chapter Twelve, which is. Uh, appropriately titled Aristotle's account of the virtues. So I'm going to hopefully briefly summarize this and then go to a, f- a couple key points in the chapter, uh, ask our guests what their thoughts are on them. Um, and then we'll uh, skadoodle on from there or let the conversation develop as it goes. But anyway, let's go. Uh, so according to Aristotle, quote, human beings have a specific nature such that they have certain aims and goals such that they move by nature towards a specific telos, end quote. And so in discussing the good for man, Aristotle appeals to eudaimonia, which is the state of blessedness, happiness, prosperity, uh, of, quote, being well and doing well in being well, of a man's being well-favored himself and in relation to the divine, end quote. So basically just doing good stuff, doing what you're supposed to do. And uh, the virtues are the qualities that enable a person to achieve eudaimonia and without which a person is frustrated in their movement towards their ultimate ends, to their telos. So the ultimate question is, quote, what constitutes the good for man is a complete human life lived to its best, and the exercise of the virtues is a, necess- is a necessary and central part of such a life, not a mere preparatory exercise to secure such a life, end quote. Uh, such virtues, quote, are dispositions not only to act in particular ways, but also to feel in particular ways, end quote. And so to act virtuously is to act from an inclination or a desire towards virtue rather than, as Kant argues, to act against it. You know, you've heard the phrase, it's not a sin to feel something. Well, it may not be a sin, but it's uh, not virtuous either. Um, Aristotle also believes that the virtues were defined not just in terms of the individual, but also in the terms of a city. And he works specifically with the polis, the Greek city-states, as this sort of um, unfortunately, unitary concept of human organization. And to find out this relationship between the individual and the polis is to consider what individual characteristics would aid or hinder some communal project, such as the founding and caring for it of a school or a hospital or an art gallery. And because this is a little bit free-floating, there is no, quote, rule-specific concept of justice, end quote. And McIntyre notes that throughout the Nicomachean ethics, which is where he lays out his uh, main ethical forms, there is a general lack of rules. There's never something that can tell you what justice demands in any situation. And justice, or rather each virtue, is a balance between extreme vices. Uh, The famous phrase, quote, "Courage courage lies between rashness and timidity, justice between doing injustice and suffering injustice, liberality between prodigality and meanness, end quote, and so on. Uh, This is the so-called golden mean. um, And this means that judgment, uh, which is phronesis, is a large part of Aristotelian virtues. You have to be able to find that right, that golden spot in between the potential vices of going overboard in various directions. Um, Also Latin prudentia and obviously English prudence. There's a part in the middle that we're going to skip and then come back to, but there's a few problems with sort of this generic Aristotelian virtue that McIntyre is going to lay out and then later on expand upon um, with uh, uh, Thomistic approach, I, I, I believe. McIntyre notes that Aristotle's insistence on the unity and inseparability of the virtues, largely due to his denial of the diversity of Athenian society, is, quote, an unnecessarily strong conclusion based on his hostility to conflict either within the life of the individual good man or in that of a good city, end quote. Aristotle doesn't deal with conflict well because he thinks all virtues should be unitary. So in any case where conflict develops either in an individual or a city is actually just due to the flawed nature of an individual or, un- or quote, unintelligent political arrangements, end quote. So he doesn't see conflict as a necessary part of life, which, which contradicts and conflicts with the views of people like Sophocles, who 
he has a bit of a tiff with and who McIntyre ends up on the side of Sophocles in the end. McIntyre then outlies some of the problems with Aristotle's conceptions with the virtues. One is his exclusion of, quote, the peculiar excellences of the exercise of craft, skill, and manual labor, end quote, because of his belief that certain key virtues are only available to those of affluence and high status. And this derives from Aristotle's belief that barbarians and slaves by nature can't be virtuous, which McIntyre attributes to the ahistorical nature of his understanding of human nature. That is, he understood human history and human nature as centering in a polis and a polis only. He didn't really have a historical imagination or view of human nature across many different kinds of human organization. Um, and he kind of just thought that, hey, the polis, it's the end of history. Um, he was kind of the Francis Fukuyama of his time, actually. But according to McIntyre, this oversight isn't a significant problem for the overall structure of his ethics. It's just kind of a hiccup. McIntyre then sums up the three final points in which Aristotelian ethics can be put into question and that I'm sure he will go on to attempt to resolve. Uh, the first is that Aristotle's teleology presupposes his refuted metaphysical biology so that, quote, any adequate generally Aristotelian account must supply a teleological account which can replace Aristotle's metaphysical biology, end quote. While teleology is good, the way that he lays out his metaphysics is a little bit fraught, so we have to find something better than that if we want to keep teleology. The second is the is the history issue, where he links human nature and the virtues to the polis as a particular and rather transient form of human organization and thinks that's the be-all, end-all, and it's very clearly not, so we have to find some way of overcoming that. And the third is that is what we also talked about, Aristotle's denial of the importance of conflict, which McIntyre believes is one way that we ascertain what our end, what our ends and purposes are, um, almost in a right Hegelian way, um, in terms of tradition, which we will loop back around to in just a second. With that uh, sort of very bare bones summary, uh, do you guys have any immediate thoughts? Is the the first is I love that quote. Uh, to act virtuous, to act virtuously is not as Kant was to assume uh, to act. A- against the inclinations, but rather to act for the inclinations or to cultivate mm-hmm. the inclinations. I love that idea. I remember that quote, quote really sticking out to me uh, back when I read this the first time. Um, very powerful quote, which it does bring about that interesting idea. I remember C.S. Lewis discussing um, the kind of nature of humanity and whatnot and how some people will struggle more with sin than others. Um, I mean, him talking uh primarily to a Christian audience, sin versus virtue or vice or what have you. Um, Mm -hmm. But I I remember that being quite a bit of comfort, kind of assuming that, or kind of thinking that the sociopath who has, you know, who fights against everything that his instincts are doing to perform one small act of kindness, it will be credited to him as the equivalent of me laying down my life for a friend. I find that oddly comforting. I, I think that there is a bit of this hope for uh, intentions going that far. But at the same time, I find this much more logical and much more straightforward. It's, well, yes, the vicious person has made themselves into a person that is vicious. And so we shouldn't be too shocked that their inclinations are corrupt. And were they to turn around, it will be much more difficult. And I'm wondering if there's in essence a way that these two can meet together, um, which it wouldn't shock me if McIntyre would just straight up say, no, Kant was operating completely outside the realms of virtue. And therefore, there's not really a meeting ground. Aristotle would just say, no, that person has made themselves vicious. And if they want to become virtuous well they better get their inclinations or i'm just trying to figure out how to, how to tie this into uh luther and calvin yeah because like luther and calvin would seem to say sola scriptura darkness of faith blah 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 well yeah that you know the human is entirely fallen and that your your inclinations and your desires your sentiments to pull in some early modern philosophers are um going to always be against the will of God and entrenched in sin, and therefore you need to go against those. The Aristotelian notion is so much more helpful. Which I would, I would like to say, that for the record, I don't think C.S. Lewis was about that. In fact, I think he, he said that if, if our moral inclinations were so seared such to the point, or to the point such that we could no longer determine right for wrong, well, mm-hmm. then we would have no notion of right or wrong except that which God gave us, but we wouldn't have any way of 
identifying what God gave us as right or wrong. So everything would be completely arbitrary. And so he, he rejected that as well. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, also Aristotle didn't really have a concept of original sin, did he? No, uh, certainly not. Yeah. And so, I mean, that might, I mean, what a Calvinist or Lutheran would say is that that's why he is so optimistic is because, well, of course, you know, our, our inclinations could lead us to virtue. We're not fallen. True. That, that is indeed what a uh, Lutheran, but particularly a Calvinist, would say. But I, I also think that while we agree that the metaphysical biology, which doesn't have an original sin um, in, in Aristotle's view, isn't good enough for that reason, the, there are other views, such as the Thomistic view, um, in which you still have original sin, but that doesn't obliterate humans as actors with potential. Um, like it does in other forms. Yeah, and I just haven't read much Aquinas and understand him enough to know exactly how he bridges that gap. All right, uh, so so let let me jump to uh, to the first thing that I I wanted to mention. Um, so right at the beginning of the chapter, and I skipped over this because I want to do the uh, Aristotelian like the actual meat of it first. But he talks a little bit about McIntyre talks about how he's going to address Aristotle's philosophy in relationship to other philosophy that exists. Um, and he talks about tradition and how his perspective of viewing Aristotle as part of a tradition that both preceded and then continued after him is a very un-Aristotelian thing to do. Uh, he says, quote, from the standpoint of truth on Aristotle's view, once his work had been done, there's meaning everyone else's, could be discarded without loss. But to think in this way is to exclude the notion of a tradition of thought, at least as I intend it. For it is central to the conception of such a tradition that the past is never something merely to be discarded, but rather the present is intelligible only as a commentary upon and a response to the past in which the past, if necessary, and if possible, is corrected and transcended, yet corrected and transcended in a way that leaves the present open to in turn being corrected and transcended by yet some more adequate future point of view. And, and, and this is McIntyre's view of tradition, that there is some progress to be made in a, a tradition by which you are getting rid of some of the deficient aspects of it and improving it in other ways. And he also says that a tradition can both evolve, or not evolve is the wrong word, can improve, but also degrade. And, you, and to determine that is an intelligible project that's something that you can actually do insert question about this passage here um what's it sounds very hegelian like you were talking about earlier it does yeah just a little bit which is interesting because i don't think mcintyre would like hegel very much oh no 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 no. here's here's how it's different than than uh hegel uh okay. hegel is about uh geist the zeitgeist and and sort of ultimate fully transcendent truth whereas tradition is inherently grounded. And I think Hegel would, that would concentrate too much on the conflict between the thesis and the synthesis. So yes, uh, tradition, mm. all philosophy of a current time will be a commentary upon an improvement or a tweaking or a it, casting aside, but it's not about, in, in, in some cases, yes, a contradiction, but it's not about the conflict that is going to come between the thesis and the antithesis that will make the synthesis. And Hegel was very much about the fact that it wasn't just, it's not just about kind of stepping stones. It's a lot about the conflict. Um, there's something inherent of the in the conflict between a thesis and an antithesis that will make the synthesis and that will be the stepping stone. And it doesn't sound like that's what Arist or that's what McIntyre is playing with at all. I th though I think he might, not in approval for saying yes history is constant refining of tradition but it's a refinement not a not a conflict okay that makes sense that th that seems to be a useful concept to sort of hang on to in daily life because for i think in general the hegelian view obviously holds but also for people with some level of education you learn that's where the concept of progress in a way comes from so yeah so the idea that there are different that there could be different content to the idea of progress um i think is something important to hold on to 
Well, I don't know about you guys, but the the very first paragraph where he talks about how he set up Aristotle as the protagonist against what he says the the protagonist against whom I have matched the voices of liberal modernity. I just got this image of like you know Aristotle and in this standing corner, standing <laughs> in at four thousand years old. Oh no, I got it even more dramatically. Is like Aristotle. Style standing with his like back to the camera, holding like two swords as the hordes of liberal modernity come at him from oh, all yeah. sides. I'm and... gonna find a meme, um, <laughs> and I'm gonna make it the image for this episode. I was gonna just ask you, that. could you make that the image for this episode? Oh, yeah, I like Airborne charging into the orcs at Mordor or something yes. like that. Oh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> that needs to happen. That's that's the, our answer to uh, the the problems of modernity and all the the mm-hmm. hordes of the modernists and postmodernists. Let's 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 jump to the uh, to the next topic and let's try and make this a kind of a quick jump. Um, next, McIntyre talks about how in a virtue schema we don't have rules. Instead, we have the question of what a virtuous person does. Do we like this? Do we like having fewer rules? Um, uh, or is it deeply uncomfortable? Stephen? I wonder here if he's playing with Anselm's idea of it is no longer useful to say that something is good, but rather it is it is useful to say something is just. And with this kind of abolishing this very utilitarian idea of we will bring about the greatest good for the greatest people, and the greatest good is clearly X, and therefore we will do X. And she in essence was like no that that's that's ridiculous we don't even know what we mean anymore therefore we need to go about with a much more intuitive idea however she she kind of ended up concluding the exact opposite whereas when you start asking is something just the question of is it just or the the question should we euthanize this man becomes immediately answerable no we should not it is never just to do that um mm-hmm. so it seemed that for her the maybe not so much the rules, but the decision-making process became a lot simpler when you switch over to that paradigm of talking about the virtues rather than these kind of different notions of good and evil, just go down to the virtues. And I, I, I think these two aren't definitely aren't uh, juxtaposed. I'm, I'm wondering if he's playing around with that idea. Um, and I think that when you do get rid of the rules, you are, I think to attack utilitarianism, you almost have to attack the rules in this case, which is a very, I guess, postmodern way of going about it. You have to kind of dismantle this rule set in order to get back to what is it to be a flourishing human being, because to be a flourishing human being, it's a little bit more difficult to just have a set of rules go and do this. To find the rules, you can't start with the rules. Yeah, I actually, as... As odd as that sounds, I think that there is something to that. Uh, you really do have to figure that out on your own. I think it's it's similar to the concept that various people have expressed, is that the best civilizations and the ones that are able to construct the mightiest edifices and live the, and live the best that can build a 300-year cathedral aren't the civilizations that are focused on living in the moment. They're the ones that are focused on the future and focusing on the future and in in that case, eternity actually helps you live better in the now. And I, I certainly agree with that. I, I'm skeptical of something like that could be pulled off now, which I think McIntyre is also skeptical of that. Um, I mean, we, we found the answer last week. We just have to stop teaching people how to read, right? Yeah, done. Done and done. We'll just stop them from reading or make them only read Plato. They can only read Plato and that's it. Or Aristotle, I guess, because Aristotle Why would you say is, Plato? I was like, hey, <laughs> hey don't what? be knocking on Plato. But only read but only? Aristotle. Only read the man with two swords facing down an orc army. That's all you get to read. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Well, Stephen, as you were talking about that, um, it reminded me of a, of a talk about politics I went to recently. Actually, I hosted that at our school uh, by James Bruce, who was talking about legislating morality. But one of his main points that he made was how when you take a rights-based approach to everything in the public sphere you it reduces down to the point where you can't talk anymore pretty quickly um and use the example of abortion where he's like you know really quickly in the debate you get to it's the right of the woman versus the right of the child you have two rights coming into conflict and there's no way to settle that because you're just looking at you know the the um the very basic rules that both people have rights but when you we're making higher bring- shots because rights are moral fictions yes Exactly. That's exactly his point. And in, what Bruce was saying is that if you talk about it morally, you can actually have discussion and you can 
actually have dialogue and reach a conclusion for one side or the other. But you can't do that if you just take a rights-based approach. So McIntyre, every year, at least so far every year I've been uh, at the Notre Dame Ethics Conference, uh, gives a talk, and this time it was exactly that. Uh, he was, in essence, reiterating some of the points he had made in After Virtue, and he brought up the the concept of uh, abortion. I think he also brought up, I want to say gun laws, so that I may be taking from the book. But in essence, that with rights, rights-based language, it does come down to this conflict that cannot be cannot be passed. You're at an impasse because you have, you know, women's rights, well, rights of the unborn, and it just never, it, it's at a complete and total impasse. I was fairly optimistic about that thought until one of my friends, um, who is a very much a psychology nerd, uh, told me that kind of classic propaganda state would just say, oh, okay, well, we're not talking rights anymore. We're talking just, okay, we'll, we'll use the word just and fit it into our own meta narrative. And we'll go ahead and just subsume that word as well. So I, I think philosophically right, spot on. Unfortunately, the cynic inside me is also like, well, yeah, politics does a really good job at taking really lofty philosophical ideas and kind of Dumbing subsuming them. Yeah, I agree. I would agree. Just got to have the peasants stop learning how to read. Of course, that means also if we're being real, none of us would have learned how to read. And True. that means we wouldn't be here right now. So, But then we wouldn't have a problem with reading. Ooh. <laughs> Good night, man. Damn. Damn. That hurt. That hurt me. <laughs> Sam's, <laughs> I agree. Sam's back at it again, every boys. Uh, I, I regret that. Can you cut it? Nope. nope. That, is, that is staying. Keep okay, uh, just what because I'm so terrible, I'm, I'm going to, to skip uh, one of the things that I was going to bring up. Um, what's the other one that I'm going to talk about now? Soft, clean tragedy is silence? What? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, actually. <laughs> uh, um, no, it's not. And that book is a bastardization of something or other. That book's book. beautiful, you <laughs> actual monster. It's a good book, but the author had an agenda. It was Death of God Theology. He Every wants author to... has an agenda. People say yes. death is not theology and then freak the crap out like the, the theologians are actually saying God is dead. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, uh, Stephen, um, <laughs> since you like the book, uh, it seems that you think that the uh, best Christian is the post-Christian, not unlike liberal modernity. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> uh, okay, we, we, we actually do need to have like a... Uh, vaguely researched out special argument about this sometime about yeah, science. i actually need to do research on that yeah yeah yeah, yeah that'd be fun to. because we've all read it so yes we have actually yeah yeah, yeah. um we're okay. better for it we are better human beings for it sorry no, yeah, I, you, you need, no, we, I, need I, <laughs> uh, yes, we need to move on yes we need to move on um right uh you know what let's just let's just jump on to uh to uh the the article that we're that we're bringing the, to the table. The um, article. I, <laughs> the I article. will go, go, go very briefly um, first because I thought I was going to have something to talk about because I was going to a talk uh, ostensibly by uh, Nate Silver, the um, statistician and founder of uh, 538, who was coming to speak at the university that I work at. And I got tickets online. I was like, wow, super cool. Going to go see him. He's going to have cool graphs and charts. He looks like such a young, hip dude. And we get to the place where it is, me and, and my coworker, and there's a line to an, an elevator that's guarded by like six people and a security guard. And they aren't any, letting anyone through. So we're like, oh, okay. So we probably just have to wait for a little bit, and then we can go up. And then they let like six people through and then say, that's it. All those seats are filled, uh, but we're live streaming it over in the student center. Uh, and so as it turns out, they gave out way more tickets than they actually had seats for. And so like all of these people in line all had tickets, all had reserved spots apparently beforehand. And uh, we were all kicked out um, and had to go watch a live stream. But as it turned out, it actually wasn't that bad because it was the event was meant to go from four to seven. I don't know if it actually went that long, but Nate Silver had no graphs, no cool slides. Uh, he barely said numbers. He just kind of gave vague opinions about things and was obviously someone who is much better far deep in the darkness behind a keyboard than he is in the light of day in front of other human beings or talking to them. So that was disappointing. And I have nothing to talk about except he, he said that uh, newsrooms need ideological diversity. He says 538 was all, was good because they predicted that Trump would win at a you know 33% chance, which is not bad. He says that everyone should go back and read the New York Times and Washington Post uh, editorials on Trump pre-election because they should make you cringe and wonder what's wrong with journalism, that those are the things being written. I didn't know that he predicted 
uh, a total of 99 out of 100 um, states correctly in 2008 and 2012 when you combine them, uh, which is pretty impressive. So it's very impressive. Um, anyway, yeah, that is all I have to say. Oh, um, uh, our one article that we have is so amazing, so groundbreaking, so colossally intellectually challenging and stimulating that we collectively decided that we would only go with this article. Uh, certainly nothing to do with laziness or or any sort of uh, you know uh, or shortcutting or what have you. It's this is the article, ladies and gentlemen. For the record, it it was not laziness. It was more the fact that I realized about twenty minutes before we recorded that you had actually selected the article that I was planning on talking on. So oh, sorry, really that was not meant to be passive aggressive or anything. That was <laughs> <laughs> it was just aggressive. It was just plain aggressive. I'm angry, ladies and gentlemen. No, I'm not. Uh, this is the article, Workism is Making Americans Miserable by Derek Thompson, staff writer at The Atlantic. The subtitle, for the college-educated elite, work has morphed into re a religious identity, promising transcendence and community, but failing to deliver. Uh, written February 24th, 2019. And it's, it's quite excellent. It opens up with... Um, the economist John Maynard Keynes, who in 1930 predicted that uh, kind of in the future, we will be encountering 15 hour work weeks, um, specifically this, he was predicting this for the 21st century, and that for a five day, or we would have five day weekends, and quote, for the first time since his creation, man will be faced with his real, or with his real, his permanent problem, how to occupy the leisure. And this was a very popular view. Uh, a lot of people were kind of anticipating what with automation lines and even more recently with kind of machine learning, AI, that eventually, you know, work would decrease and people would be able to acquire more time for leisure. And this is, as we all know, this is kind of the exact opposite of what has happened. And the, the author pokes at a few different ideas on why this may be. But he takes a very unique approach in that he he says that it's potentially this is a religion. Sam's American cults kind of rears its head again, that with the decline of traditional faith in America, that things had to fill the gap. Um, and, quote, some people worship beauty, some worship political identities, and others worship their children, but everybody worships something. Uh, end quote. And here I will say that this is uh, precisely what David Foster Wallace was talking about in This Is Water, where you are always worshiping something and you need to find something outside of yourself to worship. And you need to make sure that that thing really is transcendent and really is worthwhile of worship. And I believe the author is making the case, and I would be inclined to agree that work simply is not transcendent. It is not, it is not capable of kind of containing that worship. And this is seemingly a, uh, a more of an American concept that if you look over in Europe, you see they are kind of beginning to slowly and steadily decline in average work hours. We are increasing, or I'm sorry, no, we are not increasing. We are de we have slightly decreased, but not by much. I think the the statistic given was in the past 100 years we've decreased like 200 hours per work week. I think that's what it was. Um, the article moves on to start uh, saying that one of the strangest things is that the elite are working more, uh, that most of the time throughout all of history, the elite were the ones that were doing the most leisure. They were the ones who were throwing balls and going to various fancy dinners and whatnot, while the, you know, the uh, lower class, they were the ones uh, constantly working, the serfs, the slave class, they were the ones that worked and toiled day without end. Here, we are encountering the exact opposite, where the rich are starting to work more and more and more. Because, and this is where the worship comes in, is meaning is found in work. You are supposed to find this deep meaning, uh, your quote-unquote passion. Uh, I can't tell you how many times at work I've heard, well, you know, you want to work on what you're passionate about. In college, I would hear, you know, find your passion. You want, you know, if you if you do what you love for a living, you'll never work a day in your life, et cetera, et cetera. Which, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. And if you can work on something that you love, that's awesome. I mean, I really enjoy coding and having a job working as a coder is wonderful. But it then begins kind of collapsing when you put the the weight of uh, the weight of worship on it. 
Uh, the Atlantic uh, offers no real solutions other than uh, it kind of pointing to traditional religion as being more of a stable worship. Uh, quote, one of the benefits of being an observant Christian, Muslim, or Zoroastrian is that these God-fearing worshipers put their faith in an intangible and an unfalsifiable force of goodness, but work is tangible, and success is often falsified. To make either the centerpiece of one's life is to place one's esteem in the mercurial, mercurial hands of the market. To be a workist is to worship a god with, with firing power. End quote. It, it goes on to kind of discuss uh, millennials and kind of their, uh, what I was saying, kind of trying to find their passion, trying to find their worship in the workplace and kind of what it's starting to do and it's starting to, people are starting to burn out with this, even citing the article that I believe Brevin brought up a few uh, sessions ago. And uh, signs off uh, by saying that perhaps we can start working with maybe some form of public policy, but ultimately we need to kind of remember that the purpose of work isn't work itself. It is to give us time, it is to give us resources so we can go and do the things that really do matter. And I think uh, that Derek Thompson is not entirely incorrect in this. So I think it's a it's certainly a worthwhile article, and I think everyone would uh, benefit from reading it. I'm just amazed that they went, um, in terms of religions that believe in intangible forces of goodness, Christianity, Muslims, and then Zoroastrians? Or what happened? It was one out of left field, certainly. Like, Though intangible like forces of goodness, Zoroastrianism was very, that was kind of groundbreaking in that one. I mean, yes, but one of those things is not like the others, and also <laughs> the Jews came first. Yeah, that, that is. <laughs> That is true. That is quite true. I want to say there are still a very small amount of Zoroastrians out there. Yeah, there were. I mean, I don't, I don't know of any. I know just, I mean, off the top of my head, pop culture, Freddie Mercury was a big Zoroastrian. Or his family was, at least. His family, yeah. Um, so, as I recall, um, assuming that part made it into the episode, because we only have one article to talk about, and Sam chose this one, it is Sam's responsibility to find some deep flaw with this article and yes, uh, I have clobber Stephen over the head with it. Stephen, <laughs> this article is stupid. So, <laughs> well, you're stupid. And here's why. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I can even say why. I mean, that's it. It's just stupid. It's dumb. Uh, checkmate. Uh, yep. What are you going to do? No, um, actually, I, I like this article. I think it's a good article. And I really, it was thought provoking for me personally um, and kind of caused me to to really reassess a little bit how I'm thinking about work. However, there are a few problems I noticed with it. Um, and the one that really stuck out is, you know, he's talking about how work, it's so bad right now. There's, um, it, I mean, I, I'm seeing right now shyly or slightly dysopian about this, this system and all that, uh, referring to Black Mirror uh, oh, yeah. to our, and all this. And I just want to step back and say this is far preferable to the alternative. I mean, sure, you know, we we Zoomers have access to um, jobs and work to the point where we can work, we can overwork, we can become workaholics very easily. But in the past, I mean, we would be struggling to find work that pays as well as these jobs do. And even the work that we could find would have been backbreaking labor instead of comfortable office jobs, which is one thing as he's saying that people are working far more than they used to. That's true but they're working far easier jobs. It's easier to work long hours when you're getting paid sometimes to literally be hanging out in an office. That's very different from, from being paid to work construction or something like that. So certainly I'd say that like our, our, our work condition or our workplace is just changing. It's becoming a lot easier and hence it's a lot easier to rack up those hours. It's just different than the previous generations. And I think this part, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, no, continue. Oh, there was, uh, so I read this book called The Shallows um, that was, in essence, a, a study on what the internet it, the internet is doing to our brains. And it brought up this statistic, um, someone out of left field from my recall, but I think it's a very worthwhile one, that if we as Americans were collectively willing to go back to living roughly 1940s comfort um, style of living, that we would have to work roughly 20 hours a week to keep that up. The thing is, we're not willing. And I am inclined to agree with him on that. We're, we're not willing. I, I like all my technology. I like having air conditioning and whatnot. And I, I recall one of my uh, Facebook acquaintances 
posting something about how unnatural the 40 hour work week is. And I actually got really irritated about that because yes, the 40 hour work week is unnatural. It shouldn't be that easy. Like it, yeah. we have struggled for the past 6,000 years of human history. Plus, you know, who knows how long in prehistory to get to this point where we can constantly work 40 hours a week and really not have to do much more than that. Though sometimes we may choose to do more. So I certainly don't want to be complaining too much because yes, indeed, this is, this is pretty good. All things considered. I, I, my main fascination with the article is the reasoning behind it. And it's the consistent talk of find your passion, uh, find your meaning in work, uh -huh. which I think that is where I start raising an eyebrow and saying, but wait, why, why can't I just do a good job in that? Be it? Which I, I recall, I somewhat, I, I, I was saying something similar to my grandpa when I was in college and just saying, you know, how I really want to find, you know, a job that, you know, I just love, I want to work at something I love. And him just kind of look, give me a look and he's, a, he's an old farmer and him just kind of give me a look and saying, it's called work for a reason. And that really stuck with me. Grandpa wisdom. I think that like a lot of that comes from the fact that there's just more choice in what you mm -hmm. do. I mean, we're in a weird generation where oh, your, your past, you know, your family upbringing isn't a huge factor in determining what you can do. And so you really have that opportunity to think super deeply about what do you want to do? What's your passion? Where are you going to find that passion? Mm -hmm. And then you have the opportunity to pursue it because there's so much work available. Most companies will be able to take you on and work you as much as you want to work instead of you scraping by and try to find work. And so there's that ability to both choose what you want to do and then pursue it as hard as you want to do it, which may have not been an opportunity for everyone in the past. Which I think the article did take into account that some people will indeed find deep meaning in their work and they will be, you know, perfectly content as cucumbers working 60 hour work weeks. And that's great for them. It's just mm -hmm. may not be for everyone. And I think that may be important to, to kind of nuance, especially with employers kind of saying like, well, yeah, some of your employees may be willing to do these 60, 70 hour work weeks because they love it and they should be awarded accordingly in my mind but that maybe we as Americans need to take a step back and think, why do we want to find our quote unquote passion? Which the thing about passion is that means to suffer. Um, why are we willing yeah. to suffer so much for our work? It used to be, well, <laughs> you'd suffer a lot more if you were starving than if you were working. Now it's, well, I, I'm supposed to suffer for it because I love it so much. Yeah. And about that, like finding the fulfillment in there, this may be coming from my very limited perspective, but I think that the church to some degree has stewarded this, or at least mm -hmm. at Christian colleges, it's stewarded this, is at my school, which is a, a small Christian liberal arts university, um, you hear a lot about finding like your vocation in work mm -hmm. and pursuing God's calling on your life in work. And language like that at least subconsciously for me and consciously had me looking for work and, and thinking about like what jobs I'm going to take based off of, okay, so now what's the spiritual absolute motivation for me doing this job? And it led to a lot of depression when like over the summer I'm working at Jimmy John's. I think mm -hmm. I've talked about this on the show before um, where, you know, I'm working this job and I'm like, this isn't my vocation. Why am I doing it? Because I'd heard that message that I was supposed to find my vocation and work so many times that when I'm doing something that is not my perfect God-given calling, I feel deceived. Yeah, I, a similar story um, with my, my school, very Christian school as well, a sister university of yours, I believe. And I think it somewhat originates from Luther, uh, who sought mm -hmm. to kind of break the binary between the uh, sacred and secular as far as work is concerned. So no longer it was priests are the sacred workers and everyone else is a secular worker. Uh, he, and I think the, it did come from good intentions. The idea that if you are a sweet sweeper, sweet, a street sweeper, a sweet sweeper, um, a street sweeper, then sweep the streets for the glory of God. Sweet, a sweet sweeper for the Lord. Yes. And that's actually, actually I could turn that around, um, for a good, actually a really good piece of pushback on this article. Um, mm -hmm. Arthur Brooks, uh, President of the American Enterprise Institute, I talk about him a bit. Um, he's written a lot about this, of how fulfilling work and meaningful work is a foundational part of human dignity. And he's a Catholic. And mm -hmm. he talks about how, like, if, like, for uh, homeless populations, the first step is giving them some kind of dignified work. Um, and he looks at, like, a 
uh, the organization in New York City that works with them to literally street, sweep the streets. I stumble on that too. But uh, yeah, <laughs> sweeping the streets and, and talking to these people and they're like, giving me this first job was what literally saved my life because I had someone who was depending on me and I was needed and I was able to, to go into work. And that started the cycle that now I'm living. I, I've, I've been able to support my family. And so I guess like that, that idea can be taken too far where you know, you're finding all your meaning in work, but I think that finding some fulfillment of work is really important for humans. And I think you can have somewhat of a Kafka approach to this in that a lot of, uh, and the article brought this up as well, that a lot of work right now is so virtual, it's so cerebral, that it's difficult to see any actual results, which as a programmer, I, I do get, though I at least see my results on the screen. But for a lot of people, it's it's a very frustrating thing when they don't see actual results. And so when you give people jobs that give that have actual impacts that is a very dignifying gift to give people that i think kafka would certainly nod his head in approval and say like yes this is the horror that i was talking about of work that demeans and that makes one uh makes one incredibly frustrated by not being able to see any sort of product or any sort of or any sort of result. Uh, kafka and i guess mark and marx would also be another one which as much as I disagree with Marx, I think he has some solid points there. I forget if I've said this on the um, pod before, but there are definitely situations, in particular in terms of productive work, in which joining a monastery or something like it uh, does not seem like an unattractive option, at least a little bit. Uh, and I think there is there is something very attractive by, about that idea. Although, Brevin, I'm afraid you've kind of closed yourself off to that by getting married. Good job, you messed that one up. Um, <laughs> oh, true. <laughs> But I, I think, yeah, honestly, there is something very dignifying about the fact that in a monastery, I'm assuming I've never been to one, but your work has direct results, be it you've just, you know, made a meal for your fellow monks, or you've just created a shelter for guests, and you see the actual results of your work. Can't go for Leibowitz it, baby. I still need to read that, especially given that After Virtue is largely indebted to it. That After Virtue is a fanfic of... Uh... Can't go for Leibowitz? Yeah, yeah, you should. Um, all right, well, uh, with that um, out of uh, the way, um, elegantly done by all, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's get angry. Um, um, Sam, what is, what is your rant today? What is my rant? My rant's not angry, actually. Um, it's not an angry rant. Is that okay? I, I, well, I mean, as we remember, um, you, you, want to be, you want to be inclined towards good things so it is entirely well, possible that you're being more virtual or b- virtual yeah <laughs> uh, oh, virtual. virtuous virtuous um uh by refraining from unnecessary anger okay well this isn't much of a rant i actually did not have this plan whatsoever and i kind of forgot about it until you just prompted me but i'd say that uh my rant or note of the week is um the last couple of weeks that as we've been as we've been absent um i spent a bit of it traveling i live on the west coast and i was able to travel to the east coast and spend some time in new york and then you brevin uh courteously let me move in from the cardboard box outside of your apartment mm-hmm. i did inside yeah. finally only for only for two evenings only for two evenings um and i guess like it was a good reminder of the your joy of, I guess, spending time with good friends in good places um, and seeing the world. I, is that too, like, way too feely and optimistic for a rant? I mean, Sam is usually the one that depresses us and everyone. Really um, so okay, this well, kind of this is me making up, for, making up for all of it. Is, I'm glad uh, to see some good, feel-good rant. That will be, that will be, that, that'll uh, be my good dose of feel-good for the next 12 episodes. Yep. Yep. Um, Sam eats, prays, and loves. But there's that. It was a, uh, it was a pretty wholesome time. So yeah, that it was. Uh, uh, Stephen, uh, you go. Well, not an angry rant. It is a a, a good rant about a depressing uh, theme of nihilism in the darkness of the universe. Because I am uh, pleased to say that I'm going to be running one of my favorite, actually probably my favorite, called Cthulhu, Cthulhu module. Uh, mm. in a few weeks uh, called Bryson Springs. And Bryson I, Springs! Bryson Springs, which I ran with Brevin, Ansley, and a few of their, other of their friends. I hope there are no strings on me. Yeah, precisely. There, there are no strings. But absolutely my favorite. The monsters are horrifying. The characters are memorable. The villain is just perfect. 
and on the whole, I am very much looking forward to this and, and kind of being reimmersed in different character creation and, you know, kind of going over all the props and whatnot. So very excited to uh, to preach the, the Gospel of Sand, uh, which is the, the main source book for all their, their evil deeds and all sorts of good stuff. It's going to be going to be a good time uh, extolling the, the heartlessness and the meaninglessness of the universe and then going back to reading After Virtue, which is imbued with meaning. The uh, Fisher of Men will have a full catch. Uh, well, so as it turns out, um, all of us are dropping the ball on actually being angry. Uh, and, my <laughs> rant, <laughs> and my rant is also somewhat uh, contrived. Um, at my place of employment, I, I get access to a lot of programs and applications that are only tangential to the actual work that I do. And then I only rarely need to use, despite the fact that I would love to learn how to use them. Um, and the latest of the, the latest example of this is a survey software called Qualtrics. Um, that just absolutely lit my social senses, or my social science senses, say that three times fast, on fire. Uh, it is the coolest thing. It basically has infinite options to craft surveys of various kinds. You can do logical expressions and conditional pathways and like 20 different kinds of questions and sliders and options and quotas and like freaking click based heat map features so like you you can put an image and see like where people click on it in a heat map form it oh, is cool. so extremely cool but i will never have a legitimate reason to use any of these features um and so uh what i've decided to make do is uh, horning in cool features where they obviously don't belong um the latest example of this is i got a random survey to make for like a room sign up sheet with a limited number of things and uh so i put a image with six buttons with different colors um, and then just told students to, to click one to advance to the next page and I'm just and that'll translate to a heat map so I'll just see with a relatively small n of 29 um, what button is the most popular um, that's so, awesome so, so that's fun wow. yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think what these rants confirmed is that we're all nerds like really really nerds we really yeah. are <laughs> yeah yeah Call Dang. of Cthulhu, friendship, friendship and, and survey travel software. and survey survey <laughs> software. Wow, that's yeah. so lame. All of that it really is. After we talked about Aristotle for an hour, yeah. that's that's about okay, the situation so we're in. It is indeed. Um, so with that, the official programming is ended. But I would be remiss if we didn't talk about Zoomers. Mm. Oh, I forgot we were going to talk we about forgot this. Yes. Yes. Zoomers. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, um, uh, Zoomers is a uh, is my favorite term for the many named uh, generation that follows the millennials. So this would be uh, you, you you may have heard heard iGen or the Homeland generation. That was an early failed idea. Um, after nine eleven, they were like, hey, so all these kids that are going to grow up with knowing that this happened, they're going to love their homeland and be all protective. And so all the adults voted we don't. that. That, that would be the homeland They're generation. They're more ironic than the millennials. It is. It is. So, so iGen is is up there. Gen Z is pretty much up there. But the the final title is kind of for grabs, and the Wikipedia page actually documents as well. But my favorite one that I found so far is Zoomers. So just taking off of Gen Z and just calling them Zoomers because it's like boomers, but it's. But they're, but they're zoomers, and I just imagine them on scooters or like uh, oh, segways. I, Can they be on segways? Segways, yes. With no, we don't use segways. Are so millennial, them. guys. Come on. <laughs> Wait, how about hoverboards? Where where are they on the hoverboards? Yeah, that was the other option is hoverboards. And just to clarify, I am a zoomer ish. Sam is definitely a zoomer. Super Steven, zoomer. you're a millennial. Yep. You're a, you're you you're a dirty it. millennial. You're um, ruining everything. When when the uh, generational warfare begins we are coming for you but we will put you at the sure. front of the of the guillotine line um oh good i am glad that we're a, still on yeah. that page oh good okay yes yeah, i want the guillotine, yep. the guillotine to be nice and sharp mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not um, so else so uh jokes of zoomers um aside i did just pull up a page um with some millennial jokes um i i intended <laughs> to oh, to mock steven oh good um, but as it turns out there aren't actually any jokes that are anti-millennial. They're all millennials clapping back at baby boomers who said something about them. Because all <laughs> of the news and all of the clickbait is written by 
millennials, and they're not going to write <laughs> stuff that makes them look bad. <laughs> that is so, amazing. So, so, so I'm just going to read a few um, <clears throat> millennials walking around like they rent the place, <laughs> and then a guy <laughs> with a uh, basket full of avocados. Well, this guy can kiss his dreams of home ownership goodbye. <laughs> I, I uh, never got the avocado thing. Is that really a big thing for millennials? I mean, kind of, but also there was like a news report or some guy who went on CNN or something. And was oh, like, the avocado toast one? The avocado toast, uh, yeah. 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 Uh, oh, you're a millennial? Name one industry you've killed. No? Not many. I, I have a whole, like, you know, on the side of my car, I have a little notch for every uh, industry that's been killed. <laughs> Millennials killed department stores. Baby boomers killed the polar bears. But, but right, right, right. My deepest apologies to JCPenney. <laughs> Uh, this is a, so the article that this is commenting on is social media has created a generation of self-obsessed narcissists. And then the clap back rich men hung wall length paintings of themselves in dining rooms. So visitors could see what they looked like stood beside desks thinking. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, anyway, see, the so thing is that these are just like the worst parts of our generation clapping back about themselves. Yeah, because um, I just tried to find some Gen Z jokes, and they were even worse. They don't even make sense to me because I'm so you know detached from the culture that there there are there's no good commentary on how actually ridiculous these two generations are. No, yeah, there's there's and, it, and it's awful because every time I I think, well, hey, I can just say I don't belong, or like not I don't belong to it, but like uh, that doesn't represent me. That's like the most millennial thing I can say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah, I don't think the box. Yeah, you and every millennial. It's like, that's neat, kid. That kind of fell flat, but... uh, um, (laughs) I thought it was funny. What if we chant Zoomers? Like, Let's just zoom out here. Zoomers. 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 Okay. Wow. What was the point of that? I don't know. And... and and uh, uh, I think like Zoomer, like the boomer that like, did, you, did either of you play Left 4 Dead? No, no. That's such a millennial game, <laughs> Grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Stephen. Any final words? Shout outs, um, call outs. Whenever at church, I uh, we go over the passage where Christ uh, says that I will make you fishers of men. Let me tell you, all my friends end up giving me some very weird looks. Uh, Sam, uh, additions, uh, sub subtractions, or uh, callouts? Uh, none, zero. I, th- I think that causes a um, <laughs> an, an error when you try to. Uh, oh, I guess I didn't say divide, did I? Just uh, just add or subtract. I've already been grasping for straws this entire episode, so like, come on, let's just put it well, out. You sorry. can divide by zero as long as you approach it from one side. I mean, like, you just have to approach zero, not divide by zero, and you're good. Math. Why? Um, wow. Okay. Uh, well, uh, four. I trust you, Stephen. <laughs> yeah. All uh, calculus is based on that premise. I'm just saying. I'm just I have saying. nothing to say. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, for everyone here at the Problem with Reading Prog... Prog... Prodcast? Uh, <clears throat> uh, for everyone here at the Problem with Reading Podcast, uh, I'm Brevin. I'm Stephen. And I'm Sam. And, uh... We'll see you next time. Adios. Need. <laughs> wow, that was long, but hey, it's a Wednesday night. What can you expect? Yeah, you know, I'm pretty happy. I think we survived it. We actually did pretty good on the Aristotle portion, I think. No, we did.